It's interesting to me how much emphasis the Bible places on shepherds. And in the message, the text this evening, consequently, the shepherd and sheep. Because the sheep, they were the shepherd's life. And I think it's kind of ironic that if you were to ask people today about prominent occupations, I've got an ideal that people would talk about being a CEO of a great company. being an educator. And those jobs are great. There's contributions. But there's a lot of emphasis placed on jobs of notoriety. Yet in the pure sense, particularly in the Old Testament and even in Jesus' day, being a shepherd was not a job of notoriety. In fact, I think we could go as far as to say being a shepherd was probably something that people become who couldn't or didn't want to do anything else. Now, it was a needful job. And we'll talk more about that as we get into the text. But one of fame? You can imagine a little kid going to school and the teacher asking the class, they used to do this, I don't think it would be allowed anymore, but they asked the class, what does your parents do? What's their occupation? And in that sense, you could almost see some little boy or girl saying, my dad's a shepherd. Yet the Bible places a great deal of greatness on the occupation of shepherd. And arguably the greatest king that Israel ever had began life as a shepherd. Let's see what Jesus had to say. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in the synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Watch this. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the labors are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. As this text takes place, 
It is an extremely busy time for Christ and his disciples. Everywhere he went, masses of people followed, thronged him. Some of them, no doubt, had impure motives. They were looking for a healing. There were even those who were looking for something to put in their ledger book that they might use against Jesus. But there were some who just wanted to soak up the word that he shared. It was different. It was refreshing. There were healings taking place, yes. There were dead people being raised. So Jesus and his men were very, very busy and they could see that there was so much more to do but there was a problem there were few helpers when they looked at the scope of the work that they had been called and commissioned to do they knew that it was too much. For those 12 and Jesus to do. They needed help. There's two simple things we'll look at this evening. We begin with the multitude, the crowd, Verse 36 says he saw them. That's interesting. Jesus was the master observer. Now there was that divine part of him being fully God that he could look at people and know everything about them. But I believe Jesus had that innate ability even as a man. To look at people and see things in this text. When he looked at them, one of the things he saw was confusion. Again, verse 36, they fainted, not literally, they fainted and were scattered abroad. That means they were confused. If you know anything at all about sheep, and I say this sometimes at graveside services, when the Word of God calls the church, us, believers, sheep, it was really not a compliment. For one thing, Sheep are not intelligent at all. You don't go to a circus and see trained sheep. You can't teach them. Also, they have a horrible sense of direction. They just wander from place to place. That's why the shepherd is so important. He uses his prowess to keep them in line. He has to. I think one of the most beautiful pictures is in the 23rd Psalm. After a hard day of going from pastor to pastor, 
They were tired. He would bed them down by still waters because they're fearful. They have no defense mechanism whatsoever. Anything can overcome them. And he would put them inside of a natural barrier. And there was only one way in and one way out. And he would lay across the entrance. So anything that would get to the sheep had to get through him. My goodness, there's a sermon in that. But when Jesus looked out and he saw these people, they were so confused. They were just wandering around just like sheep without a shepherd. And I thought to myself, what a picture. What a picture of society. Wouldn't you agree? I look at the world sometimes and it just seems like people are just wandering around. There is no direction whatsoever. The only people who have an inkling of direction in their life are those who know Christ. That's it. The world by and large just wanders. I don't think it would be a stretch of the imagination to say that this is a land of confusion. But Genesis already said it many years ago, so it's a fact. It's a land of confusion. Second, having seen all of the confusion, notice his concern. They were a sheep having no shepherd. As I said a moment ago, no sense of direction. They, they were simply following ever who was in front of them. Again, it's pretty much a picture of society. There was no leadership. And I think that's true in our country today. From Washington, I don't want to get political, but the fact is the fact, from Washington right into our churches. We must accept some of the responsibility as well. I look sometimes and at our political mess and think, where are those? Where, where are the John Kennedys? Where are the Ronnie Reagans? Where are those? I don't see them. But I must also admit that even in our churches, at the national level, even local churches, that's why I can preach this because I have to bear some of the brunt as well. Where are the R.G. Lees? Where are the Adrian Rogers? Where are they? Our Southern Baptist Convention is rocked right now in so many ways. It's awful. There are scandals within our convention about abuse, We Baptists used to sit back and talk about the Catholics because of their sexual abuse. And now we're paying the result. 
I don't know how much you keep up with what's going on, but the convention right now is in a turmoil because it seems that there were all kinds of folk at the high level that knew about it and turned their ear. It's sad. So many of our churches today have become anemic because there's no leadership. And when Jesus looked out and saw the people, that's what he saw. And it concerned him. But it went beyond that. We also note his compassion. He said he was moved with compassion on them when he looked out. It broke his heart. Now keep in mind the majority of those people that he's looking at are his people. They're Jewish people. There are probably spatterings of Gentiles here and there, but the majority of them are Jewish people. And he loved them. Then he would have looked out and saw those Pharisees who's supposed to be leaders, and he knew that they were nothing but whitewashed tombs. It broke his heart. That phrase, compassion, means to feel deeply, to have pity. And as I read that, I guess it was kind of a gut check for me. Maybe for all of us. How much time do we spend praying? We've already talked about how bad Washington is. The fact that there's no leadership. We've talked about our convention. How much time do we spend on our knees before God praying? Praying. And the only one I could answer for was me. And I may note in a prayer every now and then, Lord, we pray for our nation, we pray for our churches. But that isn't what Jesus did when he looked out. It said he was moved deeply. It broke his heart so much that he wanted to love them. And they wouldn't allow him to. Are we moved touched by those around us who have spiritual needs the greatest need obviously being the need of the Lord Jesus Christ but beyond that maturing them growing them discipling them are we moved or do we find ourselves doing this and see if this is familiar well it's just a sign of the time that we're in There's nothing we can do about it. Folks, there's things God can do about it. And he can do it through us if we'll allow him to. The multitude. Now we move from the multitude to the mandate. Here's where it really gets interesting. Christ spoke of a couple of things. He spoke of a harvest. Verse 37, the harvest truly is plenteous. He's speaking about a crop, a yield, 
produce. He looked out and he said, The harvest, it's big, it's plenteous. As we look out at the world today, do we find that it's hard to find people that need Jesus? Do we? When we look out, do we find people, or is it hard to find people who are confused and they're looking for something and they're searching in their life? Is, is it hard to find them? Not where I live. Not here on this mountain either. They're all around us. Can you imagine standing before the Lord Jesus Christ as a saved individual someday and say, Lord, I would have been a better servant if there would have been somebody out there I could witness to. Oh. The harvest is plenteous. Some of these people live right beside of you. Some of them live within walking distance of me. It isn't that there are no opportunities. They're there. But we have bought into that. Well, it's the sign of the times. It's the day in which we're living. There is no lack of unchurched people right here in Beck Mountain. We don't have to go to some inner city somewhere. They're right here. They're here. And in some of us' case, they're in our families. A harvest. He next spoke of a hindrance. The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. I mean nothing whatsoever by this. I love all people, but my wife and I go over to Unicoi a lot because we just like it over there. I like that little Walmart over there. And on any given day, you're going to see all kinds of workers. Most of them Mexican. You're going to see all kinds of workers. They work. This is not a word against Mexican people. They work. This is a word against us. Because it's hard to find anyone who's in business. It's hard to find anybody to work. It's not that there's not a big harvest out there. There's just not enough laborers. And that's what Jesus said. And it was true in Jesus' day, and it's true in ours. Um, Tom Raymer, who is um, many years affiliated with our convention, wrote some great books. He said this once, only 2% of church members invite an unchurched person to church. 98% of churchgoers never extend an invitation in a given year. You say that's an exaggeration. I don't doubt it for a moment. 
to be true. There's a big crop out there. Big crop. But the laborers are few. And I guess this is one of those messages where I just meant to talk to you tonight, but I'm just too wired up. I guess it's one of those messages I feel like I'm preaching to the choir because you're here tonight. And most of you are going to be working in vacation Bible school and you're going to be your Sunday school teachers and you're all preaching to the choir. So hard, so difficult. Jesus ends on a positive note. He spoke of a harvest. He spoke of a hindrance. But he closed with a hope. Look at verse 38. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he may send forth laborers into his harvest. Now, God is sovereign. God knows what the world needs, right? Sure. Absolutely. But God respects the freedom of choice of all people. So here's the point of verse 38. It's really not throwing this back at God and saying, why aren't you sending people to help? What Jesus is saying is that we have a responsibility to pray that the Lord would send laborers. And that just dawned on me as I was studying this. How many times we go before God and say, Lord, it's a tough time. Not that we're informing Him. He knows. We need some help. And our sister churches need some help. And our convention needs some help. How many times do we go before Him? Probably nowhere near enough. Jesus called Himself the Good Shepherd. I like to use the term, he's the great shepherd, the greatest. And he has left us a responsibility to carry on. There's a big harvest out there. Lost people everywhere. Unchurched people everywhere. What do we do when it seems like we get a door slammed in our face or a rejection? Pray. And when the next one slams the door, pray. Pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would send laborers. That's my heart. Not only for Beck Mountain, but for all of our churches everywhere. We need the good shepherd, the great shepherd. If we're going to accomplish the work that he has called us to do. Amen? All right, let's stand. I, I just want to encourage.